So, uh, my name is Dylan Bauman. I'm going to be talking to you guys about the new CSS grid spec that's coming in the next, I don't know, year, year-ish. Um, it's currently in, like, beta, <laughs> kind of, sort of. It's, uh, it's, it's in your browser, but you can't use it yet unless you go in and acknowledge the fact that you might break websites if you, like, toggle a switch. Um, so it's, it's there. You can use it-ish. Um, so that's going to be how we're going to be building websites in the next few years. So I want to give everyone just like a crash course into how it's going to work, because it's a little bit different than how CSS has existed in the past. So before I begin, I need to click the slide. Maybe, maybe, why aren't you going to the next slide? Do I have to click it? Oh, dear heavens. Oh, no. OK, there we go. OK. Don't use this on live websites. <laughs> if you try and use grid spec to write like an actual client website right now, it's going to be totally borked, and it's not going to work, and everyone's going to be mad at you, and you'll think it's super cool, but it's not. So don't do it. <laughs> this is for educational purposes only. All right. So first of all, I want to talk about the difference between grid and grid, like gr grids and what grid is. So. The way that things exist right now is, this is the quotation version. It's not really a grid, but we'll talk about that in a second. So recently, developers were blessed with this new CSS model called Flexbox. It allows you to build things that you had always assumed were possible in the web, like vertically centering things and making content stretch to be the same height as a, as a different box of content. Uh, but you could never do that. But we've got that now. So like that's that's super, super cool. What's that called? Flexbox? Flex. Yeah. It's like a like a like a uh, flex box. Like super strong, very cool. Uh, but there's one giant problem with Flexbox, and that's that there's no there's no real way of defining a grid on websites today. We've all been living a lie. And I'm gonna say it like one more time because it's like kind of a short talk. I need to fill like a little bit of time, but also for emphasis. Is that we've got no real way of defining grids on websites technically. So but Dylan, I've been using grids to make websites for decades. Well, kind of sorta. It's all it's a ruse. You've never used a grid ever. <laughs> this is what we think when it comes to um, grids on websites today. We've got multiple columns, and then they stretch across different things, and we've got this like alignment going on. It looks really pretty. Everything's great. Life is wonderful. But the big issue is that it's not really a grid. It's, it's a bunch of little trinkets aligned to make it look like there's a grid. There's, no, there's nothing inherently here right now. You're looking at elements that happen to have a set width that if you math it right, will span across a row and then drop down to the next row, overflowing. And then it just happens to align with other arbitrarily whiffed elements, making a visual grid, but there's nothing actually there. It doesn't actually exist. So let's just start with a more uh, non-technical example. This is your website's content. It's a bunch of different trinkets of different sizes and shapes, and it's going to be a big pain in the butt to align it without a grid. Now, traditionally, we would use a float or a flexbox alignment system to make something like this. It looks great. The designers love it. And it's got equal spacing, and everything's all mm, hunky-dory. There's a grid, but there's not. Everything is arbitrarily placed again. For those of you familiar with design programs, we've got these rulers that you're able to well, enable. And you can drag them across to make these actual vertical and horizontal rules, which are a grid. That is a grid. You're making lines that define a grid. But we can't do that on websites today. We have to mimic this by doing the flow to the flexbox thing and giving it widths, and then it happens to line up. Well, with the CSS grid spec, we are going to be able to actually make lines vertically and horizontally and then align content like, like Battleship, saying like A1 and B2 to tell an element where to sit on the actual grid which we will define using vertical and horizontal rules. And that's pretty freaking sweet. <laughs> All right. So I want to start off by talking about terminology. 
I wanted to memorize this speech, but I failed short just a little bit. All right. <laughs> so let's talk about terminology. So first of all, we are going to be talking about grid lines. Grid lines are a single line which exists on a grid. I've highlighted them in red. They are the actual horizontal and vertical rules. Next, we've got something called grid gutters. Those are the space between columns. Uh, designers, those of you who have always wanted to have just a solid 10 pixels between each of your gutters, you can finally have that. We'll be talking about grid cells. This is an individual box which is created within a column. So we've got these, uh, these rows of horizontal and vertical boxes. One of the individual gray boxes, that's a cell. Think of like a, like a table cell in Excel or any sort of spreadsheet system. We've got a track. A track is a whole row or a whole column. And we've got a grid area. A grid area is any, sp any space defined by any four lines. This is like a custom, like I want this one through this one or this one through this one. It's completely arbitrary, but we'll come back to these later. So I wanted to start off by talking about parent properties. Parent properties are what actually most of the grid is going to be defined on. So we're going to make ourselves a grid right now. First, let's start with some HTML. We're just going to start with a container with six elements named one through six. Keep it really straightforward. I'm not going to be using any SAS or any sort of preprocessor or anything. This is all vanilla JavaScript, vanilla HTML that you can use today and rewrite however you want. In order to start using grid on the container, which is the top level thing that wraps around everything, you just say display grid. And nothing will happen. It will behave just like a normal display block, and it won't affect anything on your website yet. In order to really start using grid, you need to define your columns and your rows. These are your horizontal and your vertical tracks, like we had talked about earlier. So when we use these, we'll, uh, we're actually going to worry about rows later. Let's just talk about columns. Keep it really, really simple. So let's talk about columns. These are the vertical, the vertical lines, which most of us know how grids work. So we're going to say display grid. And then we're going to say grid template columns. And we're going to start defining our columns by saying one afar, one afar, one afar. Now, the interesting thing about this is for every single value that you put into grid template columns, that is creating a new column. So I've got three entries right here, one of our, one of our, one of our, three times. That will make three columns. If I add one more one of our, you've got a four column grid. If I take one away, we've got a two column grid. And that's it. I know what you might be thinking. What the hell's an FR? It's a new unit that's coming with grid called the fraction unit. It'll change your life. One of our, uh, FR stands for fraction unit or fraction remaining. This is calculated by figuring out how much space is currently available and then dividing it evenly based on fractions. So when I say one FR, that means one equal portion. So if we have three one FRs over 100% width, that would make a 33.33 repeating times three grid. So three equal portions. Got three of them. They're all the same thing. They're all the same weight, 33%. Now, if we were to change one of those to two FR, you're messing with the math a little bit. So now you're looking at one portion, one portion, two portion. And that would make a 25, 25, 50, because the last one needs to be twice as big as any of the other like next door columns. So it'll math that for you. So that's pretty easy. All right. So let's come back to this initial thing that we made right here. Display grid, grid template columns, one of our, one of our, one of our. We've got three equal columns and six elements. When this displays, it looks like this. This is it. We've made a grid. We have three columns using two lines of CSS. I mean, like, I've, I've fudged it a little bit because there's, like, blue and, like, borders and stuff. But, like, that's for you guys. Uh, as far as display properties go, that's all you need to get a grid started. And that's pretty cool, considering that we now need like 30 plus to get anything rendered on the screen right now. All right. So if we come back to our three column layout, you'll see that we now have equally sized columns 
and the overflow wraps to a second row. So we've got one, two, three, wrap around four, five, six. All right. Next up, we're going to talk about the gutters. Because right now, all of these elements are bumping into each other, and that's no good. So we're going to add one more property that's called grid column gap. It's the last line there. And we're just going to say a solid 10 pixels. You can say pixels, you can say percentages, you can say M's, REMs, whatever you want. And now we have separated these columns by 10 pixels evenly. The widths of the columns will be reduced based on the column width of the gap. So like if we say 10 pixels, that will automatically subtract from the columns themselves to make them thin enough to fit the gap, which is currently something we can't do. We have to math that every single time. We have to say like with 33%, but then you uh, calculate minus five pixels because when you add them all up, but yeah, it's, it's terrible. All right. So next up, we are going to talk about rows, the thing that we skipped earlier. By default, all, it technically means grid, grid template rows auto, and auto just means every single time you need to make a new row, if there's overflow, just make a new row. Like, don't, don't worry about it. Just do it automatically. And that's honestly the best default value I've seen across anywhere. I've really never defined rows. It, it, unless you're working with like a vertical website or a, like a horizontal website, there's no real reason why you'd have to define rows. So just leave it on auto and life will be great. But we can also define the grid row gap. That is the last line. It's just like the grid column gap, but this time it's your vertical spacing. We're going to set that to 10 pixels as well. And that will create 10 pixels in between the, the 1 and 4, the 2 and 5, and the 3 and 6. All right. One more quick uh, cool property. Um, if you don't want to type 1FR like 12 times, if you're doing a 12 column grid, you can just use the new repeat property and just say repeat 3 comma 1FR. And you've got your three column grid with 1FR equal spacing for all of those. Uh, <laughs> one more quick note. Um, currently in web design and web development, if you want to have a grid, but then you have a grid inside of a grid, you run into a lot of problems because each of those grids work independently of each other. So if you have your overall grid and you've got this box that's aligned flush left, but then inside of that you've got another grid, it's really hard to get the subgrid element to align to the parent grid. They're always off by like 10 pixels, 5 pixels, whatever. It's just they're, they're, they never line up. It's terrible. We've got a new property called grid subgrid. This allows you to inherit the overall grid from whatever parent you're currently inside of, meaning that you can align subgrid elements with parent level grid elements. So everything's flush again in life. And they have, ah, it's going to be, ah, I'm so excited. It's going to be so much fun. Oh, man. All right. So a uh, quick note on the subgrid. Unfortunately, that's been delayed slightly. Um, so that's in like alpha, and everything else is in beta. So that'll come soon. Um, you currently can't use this. They're working on more math behind the scenes, but it'll come here soon. All right. So that's basically the basics on how to make a grid. That's it. That was, what, four lines of CSS? <laughs> that was pretty good. All right. So that's all we need to know about parent properties if we're defining the grid on the parent level. So we're going to talk quick about child properties, how we've got the, the container, and then we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, how grid will affect the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So by default, one element that's inside of a grid will take up one cell, and they'll just go to the, the next one automatically. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 will automatically just go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, wrap 6, et cetera, and take up one unit on your grid by default. Same height, same width, everything. Now, the placement of grid of the child elements into custom areas, we're going to need to use the grid lines that we talked about. So if we come back and we look at our definition of grid lines, that's the, the single line that defines a grid. Now, the interesting thing with grid lines is that uh, when you make a three-column grid, you're actually making four lines. This, is, this math always gets a little goofy, but it's not. It's just one more than the columns that you have. If you have three columns, you'll have four lines. If you have eight columns, you'll have nine lines. What's that? Uh, Cowboys always tell you there's one more fence post than there is a fence. Yes, one more fence post and there's always a fence. 
That's a great one. So we've got three columns, three rows. We'll have four column lines, four row lines. All right. So in order to align a child element onto grid lines, we're going to use these start and end properties. Let's come back and look at this really quick. So let's ignore the rows on the left side. We're just going to look at the columns across the top. So we've got column one, column two, column three, column four. Those are our lines. Let's say that we wanted to make a div that spanned from the coordinates of row one, column one, so that's like the upper left corner, to column two, row two. This is how it will place by default, but let's just define that for the sake of talking about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to say grid column start, so the column start, ignore the grid. We're going to start on the column number one, the line, and we're going to end on line number two. So we're going from horizontally, one to two. And then we do the same thing for the rows, one to two. So if we go from column one to column two and row one to row two, we define that exact grid. And everything is great in life. You can do this shorthand by saying just a slash, like one slash two or one slash two. Uh, you can go even shorter hand, which is like one slash one slash two slash two. I hate this. This is terrible. Uh, this doesn't communicate anything because it's column start, row start, column end, row end, and that doesn't sit with me. So I prefer, I prefer this one, personally. All right. So let's say that we've got our three column grid, and we want to span multiple cells. Like we're going to take this first one and just span it all the way across. Like we want to do this with it, right? We can, we're going to have to say start at one, end at four. And that would be column, grid column, one slash four. Start at one, end at four. Ta-da, we did it. All right, cool. That's pretty sweet. Now, we can also do this with rows. We can say vertically to span multiple rows. So we can just say span from one to three. And then we've spanned across multiple things without interrupting the flow of content. So we go one, two, three, wrap back around, four, five, and then six. This is currently impossible with flex and is a big pain in the butt. <laughs> All right. You can also say span. This is like a small property. So you can say one slash span three. This will say start at row one and then go for three more columns. So that's pretty cool shorthand. Um, also, you always have an assumed span of one. So the fact that I said one slash two is kind of irrelevant. You can just say grid column one and it will span one by default. All right. So. Uh, you can also name grid lines because I think that this whole like you know one slash two and seven slash fourteen like that that doesn't communicate anything and communication and web development is extremely important. So we can name these grid lines and we'll do so by placing square brackets before, after, and between each one of these rows. So we've got one of our one of our one of our and then lines around all of those, just like. Uh, just like Right here. All right. So we've got the three columns with the four lines, right? So right here, we've got the come back all the way. Three columns, one of four, one of four, one of four. And then we've got the four lines. And then all you have to do is just drop whatever name you want between those square brackets. So let's just name them left edge, gutter one, gutter two, and right edge. So if we wanted to make something span from the all the way across the entire top row, all we would have to say is grid column left edge to right edge. And that's it. Or if we wanted to have something start at the second column or the second gutter and just span one element, we don't have to define span. We can just say grid column gutter two. And it'll just go there and then span one. Uh, the last one, if we say grid column gutter one span two, it'll start at the gutter one line and then go for two more cells. And that's it. All right. Uh, the last one I might be able to squeeze in before the talk ends is the custom grid template areas. Uh, we're going to update our HTML really quick to be a little more semantic. So we've got header, article, aside, and footer. This is where it gets really, really goofy. All right, so you'll notice this last line of CSS down here, the grid template areas. Each one of these lines, like the ones with the quotes on it, that represents a row. And each one of these words represents one of the columns within that row. If we say the word header, this is a custom name. If we say header three times, that says the entire first row, which has three columns, is going to be named header. The next row, if we say aside dot article, 
we say that the first column is going to be named aside, and then a period means empty, it means just don't display anything in the cell, and then we've got article, and then followed by footer, footer, footer. Footer, footer, footer means you know, take up the entire last row. So all we have to do at this point, this is kind of like a weird like ASCII art kind of thing, right? Like I've arted how my layout's going to look. Um, it makes this. It makes header, 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 aside, empty, article, footer, footer, footer. The only thing left to do to finish our layout is assign this appropriately. So we can say the header, go to the grid area that I named header. Aside, go to the grid area named aside, article, grid area, article, et cetera. And we've created this layout using, what, six lines of CSS? And it's completely customizable. And the best part is that if you put more content into one of these boxes, any other box on that row will expand its height to match the other elements on that row automatically. There's no like flexing anything, nothing like that. It just it does it. All right. So I've got three more minutes, according to the man in the mech. And we're going to talk about responsive extremely quickly. But this is the easiest part. All right. So we're going to make these layouts. It's going to be really, really easy. We're going to start with the same content that we had before. We've got a header. I've added a hero, article aside and footer. All we have to do, since we technically follow this layout on the far left, header, hero, content, aside, footer, and we've got the same HTML in the same order, we don't really have to define anything. We say display grid, grid template columns, one. We've just got one column, automatic rows, and 10 pixels between each one of those rows. And we've made this. In order to make the medium layout, you see that we've now brought the aside above the content and floated it to the left, content on the right. In order to do this, we'll bring in our grid template area naming system, and we'll do header, header, hero, hero, aside, article, footer, footer, and then assign those appropriately, as we did before. And it will rearrange the HTML to do this. Now for our last one, I've kind of done something impossible for flex and float alike. We've got a hero on the left, a content on the right, a side on the right, and then a footer nested up next to the article, but below the hero, but also flush with the side of the bottom of the aside. Everything's flush here. We can't do this currently. Now, the best part is that we've already assigned each one of these elements to a named area. So all we have to do is update where those named areas are, and it will flow automatically. We don't need to change anything else. No columns, no renaming, no nothing. We just say header, header, hero, article, hero aside. You'll see that hero is now stacked on top of each other. That means span across these rows. And then footer aside. And then same thing goes for aside. Aside is under aside, means spans across those rows. And we've made this layout which is completely responsive to the amount of content that it currently has within it, and it aligns appropriately. And that is my intro to CSS grid spec. Thank you.